So thank you very much. It's lovely to be here after two years online and see everybody in face again. Um, so I work in the Technical University in Denmark in the Tropical Pharmacology Lab. And I'm not talking about the snake bite today. Uh, I'm talking about how I am developing methods that can uh, serve to obtain broadly neutralizing antibodies, not only for snake bite, but for many other indications. And as we envision antivenoms, we've been shown uh, by Anne this morning, the same slide is that as we envision it in the future is substituting the pipeline that needs the immunization of horses and the purification of those antibodies by a recombinant antivenom production in which we have the genes of the antibodies that combine and neutralize those toxins, making a recombinant antivenom that is safe to produce and to administer. So that being said, we know that this is a marathon. This is how we envision the future. And we are very glad to see that the, there are many other people working on filling the gap in the middle to make a better solution in the meantime. So it's true that if we try to make an antivenom for all the sub-Saharan African snakes, we need more or less more than 100 antibodies to neutralize all the relevant snake toxins. And that's a product that is not viable, in fact. Luckily, toxins can be grouped in a structural families, and we can aim to have broadly neutralizing antibodies that will bind a neutralized group of related toxins, reducing the amount of antibodies necessary and therefore the price of the final treatment. But how do we do that? So this is a very, very complex venom. The snake venom is one of the most complex substances that you can find. <laughs> and it's true that the flagship of the Tropical Pharmacology Lab is a snake bite, but there are many other and venomation um, causes in the world, being the lead of that jellyfishes, though you don't usually die on that unless you are in Australia. In that case, you can die on a jellyfish. Um, but this is still the most prevalent life-threatening envenomation condition. But we have spiders with 50,000 cases per year, scorpions with 1.2 million cases per year, and many others that there are no really good data about it. So what I'm trying to do is to develop the methods using these more neglected envenomation causes to obtain methods that can be applied to the snake bite at the end. And a quick reminder about why it's a pain to work with uh, a small um, uh, animals or a small venomous animal. That's the result of milking a king cobra, a forced one. <laughs> Yes. Just in case you didn't cheer, I put the video with sound. <laughs> and, um, so as you can see, as she's chewing, she's injecting a little more bit of each pattern, and we're probably looking at over about three or four hundred milligrams per hour right here. We think about twenty milligrams of pink rubber venom is illegal. Okay. Well, yeah, that's milking a king cobra, and now Glenn knows very well this process, but this is milking a funnel web spider. Now, how many of the males do you need? to milk before you get an actual vial of venom you can fill them in. We look at having to have 250 to 400 miles in any one year that we would have to do every single day right through the year to keep up with the flow we need to keep on the single price. Everything okay you see the difference. Wow. So this is in enough to immunize horses, big mullion animals, big then. This is enough to immunize rabbits, as this morning uh, we uh, heard from Rockman um, uh, in Securus. So the point is that right now the problem with these antivenoms is an availability issue. So the problem is that the venom is not available to make the 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 venom is not available to make the antivenom in the in the present pipeline. So why are we going to work on small, tiny, toxic critters? If they don't affect that many people, they are not that life-threatening and they are a pain to obtain the venom. And the reason is that first, there is a worldwide uh, distribution. And you heard from Loic this morning, you can find the steatodas, for example, in all over England right now. And with the global warming, you can see how these arthropods are more and more comfortable all over Europe. Second is that the venom is less uh, complex if we look at the uh, medically important toxins. So. While in a snake, you have to neutralize a lot of different toxin families. While you are working with the scorpion and the spiders, maybe you need to neutralize just one or two families of toxins to have an antivenom product, which means that it will be faster to get it on the pipeline. 
And on top of that, we are going to solve a potential shortage, which are the benefits of not having the toxins is that you will have to produce them, but we will work with pure toxins. And also we can add special features during the production of these toxins as I'm going to show you today. So this is the pipeline that we use at the Tropical Pharmacology Laboratory to discover the, to discover the monoclonal antibodies. First, we identify the medically important target. Then we obtain the toxin. If we are talking about the snakes, we fractionate the venom that we buy. And if not, we have to express it. If you want to see me cry, ask me about funnel web spider toxins. Come with a, a tissue box and I will tell you about. Then we do a fake display technology. Today, I will be talking about SCSBs and a knife library, but there are many other formats. Then we screen them at, for binding. And finally, we make a characterization for neutralization. So this is how it looks. I'm not going in detail because Anne explained it uh, this morning with huge detail. But what we have is a library of phages that are display displaying an antibody fragment. And what we do is that we expose it to our target toxin that we obtain either for fractionation or we produce it in the lab. We let the phages bind and then we wash them again and amplify them in bacteria. Then we can make a second round and a third round, either decreasing the concentration of toxin to target for those that are high affinity binders or changing the target if you want to look for broad neutralization. So, huge spoiler. So I'm going to tell you about this beautiful example about how I found antibodies that can bind to the toxins of the reclusive spiders and the Gadim scorpion, okay? So, M. scorpius lepturus is responsible for 25% of the total scorpion sting in the Middle East and North Africa region. However, it's responsible of 70% of the fatalities. And why is this? The reason is that most scorpions have neurotoxic venom, so it's painful. However, M. scorpius lepturus is not painful because the main component, the main important uh, medically important component is an sphingomyelinase that have necrotoxic activity. So the problem is that people don't go to seek help because they think has been a reclusive spider, which is very painful, but not very lethal. However, if it has been a Gadim scorpion, you maybe die and it's very late when you seek for help. So the reason why is, as I told you, because M. scorpius and loxoxalis share a very similar toxin that is called a sphingomyelinase. The toxic activity of this uh, enzyme relies on digesting a sphingomyelin in phosphorincholine and ceramide. So this causes cell lysis because it's actually breaking the membrane, but it also leads to apoptosis as ceramide is a mediator of apoptosis, uh, apoptosis in, in cells. So instead of looking for uh, the specific animal, we wanted to make a product that can serve for the symptoms. So if you have a necrotic lesion to give this instead of it wasn't a spider, it wasn't a scorpion. And which is the tool that we use? We are using consensus toxin design. So what we do with consensus toxin is building artificial toxins that resemble an average of the sequence and therefore of the structure of a collection of similar toxins. In this case, I chose the sphingomyelinases, as I told you, and this is the structure of two from Loxoxalis, and this is what the one from Hemiscorpius lecturus, and they are apart 40% identity. And I built a consensus toxin that is more or less 50% and 60%, more or less. Um, that's the, the average rate. Not only of these four, what I did was pull in a lot of sequences from NCBI to cover not this specific species, but as many Loxox cells and as many M. scorpius as possible. As Anne explained this morning, you can obtain um, cross-binding cross antibodies by making cross panning, which is exposing in following rounds to different targets. So in the first round, you expose, you expose to target A, then you keep the binders to target A, expose them to target B, keep the one that can bind to A and B, and then you go maybe for a third one. In my case, in the consensus panning, what I tried was reducing the concentration on every round to try to find the binders that can bind with higher affinity. So the first thing that I did was uh, expressing and purifying two natural and a consensus toxin, the loxoxellus rufensin, M. scorpius lepturus and the consensus toxin. I purify, I uh, produce them in bacteria. This one, there, these were easy ones. 
I purified them to homogeneity and I made a brief characterization because it's very important that the recombinant toxins that we use and we produce in the laboratory resemble the shape of the natural ones. Otherwise we can find binders that bind to something that doesn't exist in nature. So I made a circular decreasing and I could see that the overall shape was similar to the published um, structures for Loxoxelis intermediate sphingomyelinase. Then I moved to the panning. I will show you first, which is the result of the cross panning in this case in particular. So you can see here in the first round, I had the Loxoxelis. In the second round, I changed to the Emiscorpius with the same concentration. And then on the third round, I try to decrease the concentration of the emiscorpius. So I target A, B, B. And in this case, the same with the emiscorpius, loxoxeles, loxoxeles, that in the second round, I lose more of the diversity. I don't enrich on phages that can bind to both of them. So in this case, the cross panning was not the best strategy to find cross binders. Then this is the result that we find with the um, consensus panning. So I did the first round with 100 nanomolar, a second one with 50 nanomolar, and then a last round with 10 nanomolar. And you can see that in every single round, I'm enriching four binders for both Loxoxelis and Emiscorpius. And you can say, well, Esperanza, this is a mix, mixture of phages. Maybe you have one that can bind very well to Loxoxelis, ones that can bind very well to Emiscorpius, and here you see a mixture. You are right. I also thought that. So I should clone this last round, and I made a monoclonal binding assay in which I saw which was the capacity of the binding for single clones to different toxins. So you can see this is the binding to Loxoxelis, the binding to the Emiscorpius, and in the diagonal, it will lie those that can bind to both Loxoxelis and Emiscorpius. And the farther from the axis, the better is the binding to both, as you can see in this case. So the next step was characterizing them in more depth. So I sequenced the two binders to make sure that they were unique sequences. I expressed the SCSBs. And also I was lucky enough to have collaborators in Iran that were able to send me some of the precious milked Emiscorpius lepterus venom, where I was able to purify the sphingomyelinase. And it was confirmed by proteomics that this was the right protein. So then my last experiment was meant to see if on top of binding my recombinant toxin, it can also bind a natural one. And that's what I can show you here. This is an octet, this is a binding experiment. Please don't pay that much attention if it's nanomolar, femtomolar, et cetera, because this is an SCSB, it's not a therapeutic scaffold. The only thing that I want to show you here is that I found an antibody that can bind in the same range or in the same order to both the recombinant and also the purified toxin from Emiscorpius lepturus. So this is where I am. And the last step, of course, is checking the neutralization of this toxin, which is the final uh, objective of this project. So I'm going to do an in vitro validation and I'm considering hemolysis, cell viability assays, and also an enzymatic assay of the sphingomyelinase activity, both in the purified toxins, but also in the volume that I'm lucky enough to have. So, the take home messages, first obtaining the uh, venom from insect anarachnids is the main bottleneck for antivenom production. If you are able to neutralize one or two toxins in this case, you can have an antivenom product. And we are developing new tools as consensus toxins that can drive the broad neutralization. This method developed in the spider scorpion antivenom field, we hope that in the future can be applied for the discovery of snake antivenoms and even other indication as infectious diseases. So thank you very much to all the collaborators, the group, and especially, oops, Stefanos, this Erasmus student that was helping me through all the process and the rest of the team that really was very welcoming in Denmark. And finally, thank you all for your attention. I will be happy to take your questions. Thank you, Esperanza. Very interesting. Um, do we have any questions in the audience? Yes, we have one. Yes, nice talk. You show you that you can have two monoclonals that have that binds to both uh, to the to the same molecule 
from two different uh, species. A single and monoclonal. Single, yes. a single one. Okay, mm -hmm. even even better for my argument. You have one that can it has paraspecificity against two molecules, two homologous molecules that in some in the epitope will vary in one, two residues or whatever, because otherwise would not be monoclonal against the same epitope. So how much variation can you allow in, in an epitope? Because the epitope will have about six to eight residues that make the binding affinity of the antibody. How much variation can you allow in an epitope to be still recognized by the, by the monoclonal? Because if you the, start changing it a, a lot, there will not be recognition. That's the, the boundaries that we are trying to push, and we need to know how much far away we can cross-react them. The response will be on a case-by-case -case basis because it will depend on the targets. Uh, in this case, I know, for example, that there are two conserved regions that are around six, seven amino acids across them. So maybe they are binding to those. Ways to see, we can do peptide microarray crystallization, which we are also setting up in the lab as a screening method to improve our pipeline. Uh, but I think it will be a response on a case by case basis. Mm -hmm. Or you can just do a, a high throughput assay with synthetic peptides where you make combinatorial library of synthetic peptides and, like see, a microarray. and see how, mu how much the variation do you allow. This would be also give you a generalized uh, uh, mm -hmm. answer and to see if with one, you, how, how many different epitopes, different molecules you can bind or how many would you need to, to get the paraspecificity that you that you? Yeah, would. I think it's not only a, um, a matter of how many amino acids, but also in which position and which is the amino acid chain that you make. So sure. How many varia variations? Variations you can make. Yeah, but it's 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 a it's a nice suggestion. We have it on the on the pipeline to do HDPM and microarrays, and also the the combinatorial uh, approach. I think is very interesting. So thank you, Juan. Thank you. Um, I completely agree with you that the neutralization assay is going to be the crucial one. Glad to see you got that planned. Uh, what you might well think about doing to partially address Juan's question is some quick assays, just do competitive binding assays perhaps, to mm -hmm. see, ask the question, are they actually looking at similar epitopes that overlap or not? And how about an old fashioned checking if it's linear or, or native confirmation? Like for example, the natural in the protein? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because yeah. often in other fields, they find the cross neutrons are actually com um, conformational epitopes. So the screening of a controllable library then becomes really, really complicated. And okay. Yeah. Hard you're to right. Do. There's a good pre screening before going to the expensive one. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, <laughs> Thank you. it's, oh, you're only doing it because you can do it fast with the reagents you've already got to hand. It's not replacing the, the functional assay, though. No, 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 not at all. That's already planned. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, we'll have one more very quick question. I would like to point out that the numbers you are you are presented at the beginning are very low. The, the number of scorpion stings, yes, in really? Mexico that, can, that are treated every year are half a million. So in the States are only 4,000. So the, but I, and in the northern part of Africa, even if they don't use antivenom, the number is much higher than that. And in the, in the spiders in Mexico, we use 30,000. In the States, there are 30,000. They you don't use antivenom. They use opioids instead, anti which, is a, which are wrong. But, no, but thank you very much. I mean, it's good to discuss the cases yeah. definitively. Great, thank you. I think we'll move on there. So thanks, Esperanza. Yeah.